uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, here is a, a fun little application with, uh, that I've been working on with, uh, with Angel John, among others. Uh, and uh, just so you all know, if anybody is going to be uh, in China next week for ACL, this is the 10-minute uh, fun version of the talk that, uh, that we're going to be giving. So um, you know, if, you want to, if you want to wait and hear the, uh, hear the real serious <laughs> version, then uh, you know, feel free to like, work while I'm talking here. But uh, you know, if, you, if you would rather go, uh, go see other talks while we're giving ours, then uh, you're in luck. Um, so uh, 3D scenes are, are used in a, a wide variety of creative applications. So probably the two that you're, you'd be most familiar with are 3D video games and, uh, and animated films. Um, it's, they're also used quite often by interior designers and architects and product designers to, uh, to try to see what their product is going to look like before they actually build it. Um, and uh, a lot of the time, these scenes don't start out as their 3D geometric representations or even as a visual sketch, but they start out in the form of natural language. So here's a, uh, here's a passage from the, from the screenplay uh, that laid out this scene in Pixar's Toy Story 3. Um, it starts out, an idyllic daycare classroom filled with the happy bustle of four and five-year-olds playing with toys. Um, and it was the job of a, uh, a very large team of professionals at Pixar, animators, designers, uh, uh, 3D artists, uh, to painstakingly place every object, every little detail that they need to bring this scene to life. Um, and so you can bet that we would, want, uh, we would want to alleviate the burden of some of the tedious tasks that are involved in this. Um, now, uh, building an automatic system in order to do this entire thing from scratch clearly involves a lot of challenges. Um, here's, a, uh, here's a pipeline for the, uh, for the system that, uh, that my co-author Angel worked on and presented uh, last year. Um, first, you've got to uh, parse the natural language input and uh, interpret it as visual concepts. Um, you have to specify concrete objects to realize those concepts. And then you have to lay them out into a complete scene, respecting the constraints that are in the, uh, that are in the description. Um, and so the, uh, the particular area of this that we're focusing on with our most recent work is this object selection task. And the, uh, the main challenge of this is just that people use a huge variety of, of lexical knowledge in order to give these sort of descriptions. So for example, this piece of furniture <coughs> for storing clothes can be referred to as a dresser, a chest of drawers, a cabinet, cupboards, a bureau, what have you. Um, and uh, most of the systems for, for doing this have relied on manual annotation for, for all of these. Basically, a person has to go through each of these 3D models and say, like, what are all the different ways that, uh, that one could refer to this if they wanted to put it in a scene. Um, another uh, example of this problem of lexical variety is that you can have modifiers that are unanticipated. So in this case, we have, a, uh, we have our old system which, uh, which didn't realize in this case that wood was intended to be a modifier for chairs. And it said, oh great, okay, a wood, I know what that is, I'll give you four of them. Um, and then, then it added some chairs to, you know, just to make sure that it gets everything. Um, so uh, the question that we're trying to answer here is can we fix this by learning from data? Um, so in order to learn from data, we're going to need a data set. Um, we went out and uh, collected on Mechanical Turk um, a data set of uh, a little over a thousand 3D scenes and, uh, and a much larger number of descriptions of them. And the way we did this is by starting with a set of 60 simple sentences that we wrote ourselves that just uh, specify a few objects that need to be in the scene. We gave each one to a number of uh, Mechanical Turk workers um, and asked them to build scenes using a simplified online interface. Um, uh, here's a picture of this interface. Um, the general structure of these scenes, you have, um, you have a small number of, uh, of atomic 3D models um, and their transformations in space, so their position, scaling, and rotation. Um, and each model is given by just an ID. Um, but that ID is linked to a database that then tells you exactly what the model looks like and also has a little bit of uh, human curated information about it. So we have some, some keywords and a, uh, and a specific category for every model, like this one is a type of chair. We have a, uh, we have a link to a lemma in WordNet 
and we have a little bit of geometric parameters that tell you by default like how big this thing should be, which direction it should be facing, what's, what's the front of it. We have some, uh, some of these scenes. Um, then we want to turn around and get more realistic descriptions from them, because as I said, the, the original kind of seed sentences were not very interesting. They're just like, there's a table and a lamp. Um, but if we ask some mechanical Turk workers to describe these scenes for us, they often give us a lot more than just there's a table and a lamp. So this guy just says, okay, I see a bed and a chair. Uh, but some of these, you know, you might find these passages like this in a uh, home design manual or whatever. Uh, floor to ceiling windows on the back wall, green bed with two pillows and a black blanket, lights recessed into the right side wall, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, you can see that there's also, even though we started with a, with a fairly limited set of seat sentences, there's also a great deal of variation in the scenes. So each of these has a different bed, you know, it's on a different side of the wall, you've got different paintings and you know, the, the orientation of the chairs um, is, is kind of uh, subtle depending on what else is in the room. So in order to learn from this data set, we, uh, we set up a uh, classification task. So the goal of this classification task briefly is to um, identify the scene that inspired a particular description um, given a number of distractors. So we took each, each pair of Turker built scene and then different Turker description of it. And then we threw in a number of random scenes drawn from the rest of the data set. Um, and so our, the goal of our classifier that we're training here is to read this description, brown room with a refrigerator in the back corner, look at all the scenes and decide that of these five scenes, only scene D is the one that matches that. And so the, uh, the model that we use is relatively simple. It's a, uh, we just use these, uh, this one versus all logistic regression model with some, uh, some cross product features based on um, n-grams for small n and, uh, and specific model IDs and also the category of each model um, from, the, from the model database. Um, and so while this, uh, while this task is not our, our main goal in this work, uh, it should be noted that the, uh, having category information gives us a lot better generalization ability in this, this task in particular. Um, that'll, that allows us to identify scenes a lot more reliably. Um, so just, here's an example of some of the, uh, the lexical information that we, uh, that we can get out of this. You can see that uh, if we're trying to match words to categories, we get a lot of identity mappings. We learn that chairs are chairs and couches are couches, but we do also learn some important lexical variants. So for example, the word sofa refers to the category called couch. The word bookshelf refers to the category called bookcase. And each of these things may not have been anticipated by the people who were tagging these categories in the original data, uh, model database. Um, you'll notice also that we've got this uh, false positive here due to the fact that uh, fruit almost always occurs in bowls in our data set. Um, and so since we, we don't have any particular sort of compositional information in, uh, in this model, we can't disentangle this co-occurrence from the actual lexical meaning. So uh, as a reminder, our real goal is to actually generate these 3D scenes from text. And so how do we do this from, uh, from our uh, our from just this lexical knowledge. Um, one, uh, one baseline approach that, uh, that we implemented is basically um, <coughs> we take our description, um, we break it up into the same n-grams that we did before, um, and then we look at all of the models in our database, um, and we look at the weights that connect each n-gram to, to the object, um, and we sum them all up. Um, and then we pick the, uh, the top k objects by weight. Um, and so in this case, we chose k equals 4 because that's just the most, uh, the, the average number of objects that uh, human chose to put in a scene in our, in our data set. Um, and so it's kind of a dumb baseline because uh, you, can't, uh, you can't represent really relationships between objects. Um, and furthermore, sometimes you'll, you'll get something like uh, you know, the, the most likely objects to occur given this, these bigram associations are in fact four sofas um, because they mention sofa a lot, but it doesn't care about any of the other things that they mention. Um, but so um, in order to actually, uh, to actually get a sensible scene generation system out of this, 
Um, we combine it with a, uh, with a rule-based parsing system to give us uh, some measure of compositionality. Um, so the, uh, the parsing system is the, uh, is the same pipeline that I, went, uh, that I outlined at the beginning. Um, and the way we, uh, we integrate this is for every, uh, for every phrase that we decide is, a, uh, is supposed to be a, uh, is supposed to describe an object, we first pick a uh, category that we want for that phrase. Um, and we do this with the same sort of summing of weights. Um, and we do this only taking into account the words in the phrase. And then once we've chosen a category, we've got a number of candidate-specific models. Um, and so at this point, we take into account um, a little bit of information from the dependency parse. We decide not only uh, which uh, engrams are part of the original phrase, but we also try to include other sort of descriptors that are attached to it. And then finally, we take into account all engrams from across the sentence weighted with a, with a somewhat lower weight to uh, account for the fact that uh, we don't think that these are describing it, but sometimes our, uh, sometimes our dependency parses are not correct, so we can include some global context here. And so um, you know, here's, a, here's an example of what can be uh, output from, from this scene once we combine these two, from this system once we combine these two elements. So here we have a round table is in the center of the room with four chairs around the table. Got it, got it. There's a double window facing west. Um, you notice that I picked the right room here. You've got a double window that appears to be facing west, and you've got a door on the east side of the room. So. Um, in order to figure out if, uh, if we're actually improving things with the system, we actually did one, uh, one final Mechanical Turk task, which is to ask, uh, ask workers to give us a rating from one to seven of how well the generated scene matched the description. So the four systems that we were comparing <coughs> are a random system, which just picks four random objects. Um, this system, which we're calling the learned baseline, which is what I described earlier with, uh, with picking four objects to maximize the sum of weights. Um, this is the pure rule-based system that, uh, that Angel presented last year, um, which, uh, which relies on manual annotations for the lexical items. And then this is the system that combines them. Um, and so uh, if, you, if, you only take it, if you only feed in the seed sentences, the original 60 simple sentences that we wrote, um, then you can see that there's not much of a gap between the pure rule-based system and scenes that humans build themselves. Um, and this shouldn't be surprising because, of course, we built this system having simple sentences like that in mind. Um, but if you use the, the much uh, more varied language that the Turk workers gave us, um, you can see that there's quite a big gap that opens up here. Um, and uh, so uh, if, you, if you try it using only our, uh, our lexical knowledge without having any of the, uh, of the rule-based system, you can see that we definitely don't do as well. Um, clearly, using only the extracted pairs of objects without taking into account their relationships or, or you know, any, anything else about how the objects uh, co-occur in these sentences, you definitely can't do as well as the, uh, as the original rule-based system. Um, but if we combine the two, we can see that we make quite a bit of headway in these, uh, in these varied scenes at, uh, at the expense of not too much of a decrease in our original seed sentences. And so we're, we're definitely handling the, uh, the variation in lexical uh, variety. The, the, we're definitely handling the lexical variety a bit better in this case. So um, let me show you some, some uh, particular example of uh, how this uh, system uh, improves. Um, so here we have a black couch with red cushions, two white pillows, and one black pillow. So each of these mentions of the pillows is actually contributing as a descriptor that allows us to pick this, this model, which is exactly the one that we want. Similarly, we've got a wooden coffee table with a glass top and two newspapers. And we've got a wooden folding chair. Um, now, there are a couple of things that are also wrong with this. So the wooden folding chair, if you notice, is not facing the couch as we want it to. And uh, yeah, where did this thing come from? Um, so uh, I'll close with a couple of challenges that, we, uh, that we're looking at uh, trying to tackle over the coming 
years. Um, so uh, we need to figure out how to learn spatial relations. Um, so we've got a uh, hand-built uh, rule-based system for figuring out spatial relations. Turned out we missed facing in this case. Um, and then the other problem that we have is co-reference. And this is probably what is going on with the previous scene. But here's an even simpler example to demonstrate it. We say there on the middle is a table, on the table is a cup. And voila, we've got two tables because we mentioned table twice. So uh, that's it for me. Um, if you would like to play around with our data set, we've released this online. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll uh, take any questions. So um, there's some really neat data available in the form of dialogues in movie uh, uh, scripts. Mm -hmm. Is there a place you can go to get sort of scene descriptions from movie reviews? That was a really interesting example I thought that you started with. Dialogues in movie scripts. Yeah, that's out yeah. there. There's several different versions of that, but I don't know any that are that are just like the the scene descriptions like you gave from the Pixar movie. Toy Story, whichever number that was. I don't know if there are any. If there are plays. any. <laughs> what was that? Plays have seen. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the, those. Yeah. Certainly, the screenplays could, could be interesting in that regard. I don't know if there are any publicly available three D scenes though from some of those. Right. Films. You would. You would actually have to read it and figure out what it meant before you could decide whether they sure got what it meant. <laughs> Only if it automatically generate. <laughs> um, the relational terms uh, are going to be really interesting because um, uh, a lot of them are, are kind of like their preferences, right? So you've got something, you've got a building and then in front of the building, yeah. right? So it depends on which way the building is facing. Um, whereas, you know, if you put a flagpole in front of the flagpole, it's going to be either seen relative or or relative to you as the observer. Do you have any notion of how to build out kind of reference frames for dealing with that? Yeah, I should I should mention that there's been a lot of interesting work in that field, both both by Angel, with whom I'm going to be giving this talk next week, and by uh, the the folks at Words Eye, which is uh, which is another text to three D scene generation system that's out there. They've done a lot of looking at uh, spatial terms, but I do think that the the distinction. Uh, this is the egocentric, allocentric distinction. Like, do you do you refer to things as being to the left from my point of view, or from the chair's point of view? Um, things things like that. I think that there can be a lot more work, given that we've got a data set like this, um, in figuring out like when people use what frame of reference. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you do that. I mean looking at how consistent humans are with this task of, say, generating the 3D model given the same text description. If you have multiple people do it, how similar are those scenes? I don't have any numbers on the similarity between the scenes. That's actually a really interesting question. We have some numbers on the similarity between the descriptions, and uh, uh, those people tend to be wildly divergent if you just tell them to, to describe the scene because they all notice different stuff. Um, I, I get the impression that they tend to be fairly consistent on the categories of the objects. So they'll 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 notice this. They'll they'll put in the same types of objects and the same numbers of them. But uh, the within the, those categories, they place them differently. They choose different models. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I haven't I don't have quantifiable statement to say about that. <laughs> Thank you.